ladies of el salón the chronicles oye ladies of el salón the chronicles escucha ladies of el salón the chronicles another episode of el salón chronicles i'm liz i'm mari i'm suli and today we have the honor again of having our resident trial lawyer Omar from Armansar Paramio Law Firm. How are you? Hey. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me back. So Welcome. can we catch up? Can we catch up a little bit, Omar? What interesting things have you been uh, litigating lately? What's been going on in the legal world quickly before we get into the meat and potatoes of what we want to talk about? Sure, sure. So uh, here at my office, and I'm, I'm located in Long Island, Babylon, New York. Um, the office is growing. Uh, we do a combination of criminal defense. Uh, I myself am a former prosecutor of five years. I was a trial attorney for the Suffolk County DA's office. And now as a private attorney, I handle a lot of criminal defense cases from little things like suspended licenses, shoplifting, all the way to attempted murder, rape, gang charges, uh, RICO charges, things like that. Along with that comes traffic tickets and a lot of car accident cases and personal injuries. So the office is expanding. We, we started in Babylon years ago. Uh, we now have a presence in Nassau County. We have a presence in Hempstead. We have a presence in Riverhead. Um, I do a lot of work in the city still. So, you know, things are for the office are going up. Um, some interesting things that affect my world and affect everybody really are some of the changes in the laws in New York and the criminal justice system. We all heard about the verdict of, uh, you know, the Chauvin trial and what that has meant for everybody and how it was very symbolic on a national level. But right here at home in New York, uh, just a few weeks ago, the Manhattan DA's office is talking about not prosecuting prostitution charges anymore and what that means. Uh, marijuana has been legalized in New York, so not just that the DA's offices are no longer prosecuting them, but New York State has actually passed a bill legalizing all marijuana low-level possession. Still not legal to sell without a permit. So if, if you sell it, you still get hit with a felony. Um, Damn, but uh, they also passed laws reforming bail. They also passed laws uh, reforming or what's called raise the age. They also passed laws as to what DA's offices are allowed to and not allowed to withhold before trial on a criminal case. So all these are big changes that are actually going to be making, in my opinion, an overall positive impact on the criminal justice system. So I have a question, I'm sorry, with regard to the prostitution piece, and I was actually not aware of that. Um, and so what does that equate to, to actually, is it decriminalizing it or is it, we're not prosecuting, are we going to now, because I know there's been conversation in the past about um, taxing it uh, so that the city can have revenue and all that. So what exactly, could you break that down a little bit? Yeah, so New York State has a law under the criminal procedure law against loitering for the purposes of prostitution. Essentially, if a police officer sees a person on the street and they are offering sexual services for money, or if they go into typically one of these massage parlors or places like that and they see people uh, working for sex, so they find ledgers, they find cash, they find uh, johns, quote unquote, uh, in the establishment, they can round up everybody and arrest them. Those sorts of charges are now as per the prosecutors, when those charges come up, the prosecutors are going to do what's called decline to prosecute, or they will simply dismiss it at arraignment. Um, so on the books, it's still illegal, right? New York state law has not passed anything decriminalizing it. But if you happen to be arrested by NYPD in Manhattan, once you get to court, the DA's office will move to dismiss those charges. Now, very often, especially in the last 20 to 30 years, the DA's offices and the police move together, right? That's not always the case. Sometimes the police don't agree with what the DA's offices do, but for the most part, they move together. Um, so if the DA's offices, they're making an announcement, they're no longer going to prosecute these charges, that means usually the police stop making arrests for these charges. Now, again, it's still point? illegal, but the police now are on notice, hey, if we arrest them, this case isn't going anywhere. So usually the police commissioner says, just stop making those arrests. Now, the police commissioner is all of NYPD, and this change is only for Manhattan. So what's going to end up happening, and all the borough DA's offices already had a meeting, a lot of them are going to follow suit. And they're going to do the same thing and decline to prosecute. does not change the law. It changes enforcement, two different things. What happened with 
pro- what's happening with prostitution now is what happened with marijuana about five years ago. Manhattan DA's offices and the boroughs declined to prosecute low-level possession of marijuana charges, even in public, right? So you can be smoking on the street, and even if you get arrested for it, you get to court, it gets dismissed. And after that, a lot of other jurisdictions started doing the same thing. And after that, police stopped making arrests. And just this year, they finally passed a law making marijuana possession legal. So this is going to go along that same trajectory, and I think it changes a lot for especially women that find themselves in these positions and get arrested for something that they may not have as much control over, maybe doing out of necessity, and now you get saddled with a criminal conviction where your fingerprints are in the system and they're in there forever. So it's a big deal, this this change in the prostitu- in the enforcement of the prostitution law. It, it, it's probably going to end up decriminalizing eventually, but that's not where it is yet. I think, yeah, but I think it's more of a social issue, and that's why people don't want to decriminalize. The same thing with marijuana. They're like, oh, it's such a bad thing and all that. I mean, I'm not you know, advocating for prostitution. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, <clears throat> but here, here's what I think, though, um, because I, I feel like no like no one should be prosecuted for what they choose to do with their body as a consenting adult however does this now incentivize trafficking do you think it does because i know that well at least when we worked in uh, suffolk county we encountered a lot of also trafficking when they would bust those um, massage parlors majority were immigrant women that didn't even speak the language while the johns got away scot free and the traffickers they were the ones that were prosecuted and then you know deported or whatever so now that they're going to be more relaxed on uh prosecuting these cases does that incentivize the the you know the traffickers to now you know there are no consequences why not that's a great question so good point yeah you you have to think of human trafficking or sex trafficking as what's on the books as a law versus what we understand just having conversations with each other what trafficking means so when i hear just as a regular person or talking to people about human trafficking you think of exactly mari kind of what you're referring to where immigrant people who don't know the language are brought into the u.s or brought into new york or perhaps young youth right brought to new york from another place and they don't know how to navigate the system here. They don't know who to turn to for help. And now they're literally have been brought from another place to New York for the purpose of sex work. And they're, it's essentially kidnapping, right? You're you're taking somebody maybe under false pretenses from where they're coming from and you promise them and they come voluntarily. They, you promise them things and they get here and it's, it's completely different. And now they're trapped. That's what we think of normally as trafficking. However, under New York state law, trafficking is a little bit more specific. It's when somebody imposes upon somebody else a life of or a a time period of working for sex against their will right so you can have someone from uptown manhattan and you send them to the financial district to work at these fancy parties as an escort they're in manhattan they know the language they grew up here they were born here they know how to go to the police but for one reason or another they feel like they can't turn to anybody for help and they must do this sexual act for money that's also considered trafficking. So there's no element under New York state law of having come from out of state or out of jurisdiction. There's no element of this person being an immigrant or undocumented. It's just, are you forcing someone into sex work? That's it. So it's a little bit more specific. And in a way, it's a little, it includes more people, right? So will this change in the law prevent human trafficking, whether it's under the law, whether it's just a normal conversation about it? And the way I see it is when, when they had these raids They would go into a massage parlor, round up all the women, arrest them all. Maybe a John or two were arrested, but for the most part, nobody was arrested. But the the women that were there uh, forced into this life of prostitution, that's like playing whack-a-mole. I don't think, and this is my opinion, I don't think arresting those people actually made a dent in the human trafficking. I think the traffickers just found other people to go and, and bring into the industry. So it's almost like you can look at this almost like a drug dealing. Do you go after the people using it? Do you, do you go after the addicts or do you go after the drug dealers? And the idea is you arrest the addicts and you flip them. You turn them into informants for the government to then turn on who dealt them the drugs. You arrest that person, flip them to turn on who dealt them the drugs. And eventually you go up the ladder and you get the big time major traffickers of the narcotics. 
does that system actually work? You can say, it just you know, paves the way for somebody else to move into that position. If if you look at thank you, if you look at the history, America's history on the war on drugs, I mean, unless it, it's it's 30 years now that we've had this uh, sort of like draconian laws on the street peddlers, putting people away for 10 to 15 years for grams of, or, you know, a few rocks of cocaine and trying to use that system. It hasn't worked. Right. I don't think anyone can look at America's drug on wars and say this really has stopped the flow of drugs into our country. It hasn't. So. Now you're applying the same tactics into this war, uh, into this uh, battle against human trafficking. I don't think that changing this is going to is going to make things worse. If anything, I think it's going to give a space for those who want to engage in this sort of behavior voluntarily to ha do it with protection. There's always going to be a black market for it, and now you can actually go after the people that are more insidious, right? As opposed to usually the women that are in the parlors or on the street doing it. The other part about this change in the law is there has been a large community of trans people that get caught up on these prostitution loitering charges by the police who unfairly target them and use these bullshit laws to be able to say, oh, I see this trans person walking around in a dress and high heels and I'm going to now arrest them. And you don't really have to have much to make an arrest. Probable cause of what? I saw someone walk in the street suspiciously. That's all they need. And again, same deal. Once your fingerprints are in the system, you're stuck in the system. And I don't care if you get your case dismissed. That's just like glitter. You always have a rap sheet hit yeah. when you have your fingerprints in the system. Uh, so it, it's, it's been not just for immigrant women, not just for women in general, also for trans people. This has been a very important change in the way these laws are being prosecuted. So I, I hope they make a path. I don't know about it being tax and legal. That might be a stretch too far for New York State. But I hope it does make a path where this sort of stuff isn't so penalized so heavily and falls disproportionately on women and immigrant women. You mentioned <clears throat> that, and just and not to what you were talking to, but I just found it very interesting. You said that if you get fingerprinted, um, basically that follows you for the rest of your life. So what happens to cases when they get dismissed or, you know, you go in and let's say you were uh, arrested and by mistake, and you get fin fingerprinted, so then that doesn't get thrown out? So when the judge says, we're throwing out the case, that's not, that's not the case? Yeah, here's, here's the dirty little secret, and I, I hope I'm not betraying any confidences from my colleagues still in the DA's offices or working for the governments, but surprise, that shit don't go away. Here's what happens. I'll say it. I'll, yeah. I'll, if you don't want to say it, if you don't want to compromise yourself, I'll say it. It doesn't go away. Yeah. And there's no note what's happening. Where are we flying? Somebody's getting bombed. No, oh, is it Mari? Me? <laughs> Somebody says that. It's, it's me. Oh, you have an air, <laughs> you have an airplane flying through. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. It's gone. Um, Sorry. Yeah, and there's and there's no side note that says you have to, you know. And the the problem is, and that's a, I don't want to answer the legal piece of it. I'm going to answer from my experiences being on the job, and then you can answer from the other side. Right. There's no little side note that says we were wrong and we messed up X this out. You know, you're you're viewed as what is on the paper, mm. not what you were brought in with, whatever. And those are, uh, 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 you know, you're you're there's already a, 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 a an opinion of you formed. So you come in and let's say you got arrested 15 years ago because they said you stole a pencil, but you didn't. And it got thrown out. Well. When you get there, I'm gonna okay. So she's a thief. She got charged with larceny or whatever. I don't wow. not even. I'm not even hearing what happened and that I was found innocent. And so you're judged on that, and then you have the burden of trying to explain yourself that no, 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 no. That's not even close to what happened, and we see that happen every day. Why don't they change that? So uh, exactly where I was gonna go with that. So uh, Omar, you mentioned in the beginning about you know the. Um, Derek Chauvin uh, verdict and what we always discuss here about police reform. How realistic is defund the police and perhaps changing the system so that this example that Liz just gave isn't what continues to happen because that's the same thing as profiling. Right. So <clears throat> first of all, I, the phrasing and the way it comes across of the term defund the police I don't like it. I don't like it is extremely extremely uh you know 
it, it already starts splitting people apart before you even get to yeah. the merits of it, right? Yeah. Because imagine if we were to say something like get rid of all and then just insert a category of a type of person or a type of profession or a type of job. That's what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So even once you get into the weeds of what, what do you actually mean by defund the police? Well, we, we mean re reallocate resources and change with the right. police. Okay, those, those things should be discussed, but you can't boil it down to a phrase like defund the police because right. On his face, that means get rid or abolish or get, right. you know, no longer fund the police. So, Correct. you know, that's a major problem that I have with trying to boil down such a complex concept into just that one, you know, three word sentence uh, because it, it can't really fit everything. And here's what Liz was alluding to. And this is what I see in my practice every day. I go to work on a client's case. And in New York State, you have three levels of charges. You have felonies, which are the most serious. You can go to way, go away to jail for up to life. You have misdemeanors, which are crimes, but not as serious as felonies. They can put you in jail for up to a year. And then you have things called violations or infractions, like a speeding ticket. Um, you know, you get into an argument with a neighbor, but no one gets hurt. Uh, you're drinking a, a beer on, on, on a lawn in public, and you get picked up for that. You're in the park after dark. Those are infractions. Infractions are not supposed to be crimes. They're not supposed to go on your criminal record. I'll work on a client's case. They get charged originally with a felony. We get the case reduced down to a violation. It's not supposed to be a crime, not supposed to go on your criminal record. Your record is supposed to be technically sealed, right? Then a few years later, we have to make an application to USCIS. They go get fingerprinted, and all of a sudden it pops up. And so if I got the case reduced down to a violation that's sealed, and it's not supposed to be on your criminal record, why does that pop up on your immigration application as a crime? So these are things that come up all the time. Also, if that same person gets rearrested by the police in the same precinct or in the same department, they have their own internal records of any prior arrests on you. I've sat in court, especially on yep. domestic violence charges where you have 911 calls, right? And you can argue about the practicality of keeping that record, but the law is clear. If your charge is dismissed, you are supposed to be returned to the place you were before the charges ever happened. It's that supposed to be as if it never existed. It never and I've sat in court and I've listened to prosecutor after prosecutor read a long sheet of, well, in 2007, there was a domestic call at this, re at, at this residence. At 2005, another domestic call. At 2003, another domestic call. So this person with this domestic charge must be guilty. Judge, please set bail in the amount of $100,000. And the judges do it. But what they don't know is, and what they don't tell you is, that domestic call may have been for the previous tenant or for someone else in the family calling for help for a drug overdose or for something else. And they all show up the same, right? Even mugshots and fingerprints. When I used to work at the DA's office after a case was dismissed or reduced, we got a notice saying, hey, uh, we were informed that this by uh, DCJS, this charge was dismissed uh, or reduced. Please submit your physical file to be destroyed. And there was no follow-up if you didn't do it. So guess what the prosecutor has next time that case comes around? They can pull up their old case from archives and be like, oh, look at this, look at this fingerprint, look at this mugshot, look at this charge. And they don't look into how the case actually ended. They just have the fact that you were arrested. And that stays on there forever because these internal records are not controlled by New York State or the federal government. They're controlled by the local precincts or the local prosecutors. And they don't want to give up their internal information. And the thing about it is, is that just like when you serve your time in jail, you have to put on an application that you are a felon. So you're continuing to serve your time. You're continuing to be uh, uh, having to pay for this that you already paid for 10 years. So that's another piece of it. But um, specifically for Omar, so if you're charged as a juvenile, there are some offenses that after it's adjudicated, your, your case is sealed. As an adult, there are circumstances under which that case is reopened. Correct. So that's number one. Um, and I want you to discuss a little bit on what those, ex, you know, examples could be. And the second piece of it, you know, when you request to have your record expunged, that would technically mean you get rid of everything again, right? Because why we have all these examples where the case is sealed or the record you, it was brought down to a violation, so it's not supposed to exist, and we already know it still exists. What about when you apply to have your record expunged? That's not what I thought it meant, that it's gone, disappears. Wow. Uh, right, yeah. so uh, <laughs> New York State- I'm gonna let up, Omar do that. <laughs> yeah. New York State up until very recently did not have any 
form of expunging a criminal record. You can have a case from 30 years ago that was a low-level violate, a low-level charge, a shoplifting. You stole literally a pack of cookies on the way out from a bodega, and if you were convicted of that, that stays on your record forever and ever. About four or five years ago, they allowed nonviolent felonies and misdemeanors. More than 10 years have passed, no other criminal charges. You can apply to have that expunged. But it's specifically the record with New York State. Not, it doesn't tell the police to get rid of their internal documentation and records. It doesn't tell the DA's office to get rid of their internal records and documentation. So if the police wanted to look you up or the DA's office wanted to pull up your old case, they still had access to it. So what does it actually do? Maybe if you were to get your fingerprints done for a job application, perhaps that wouldn't come up, but it's not a perfect system. Sometimes cases that have been expunged have shown up, and what's worse is it shows the charge, but doesn't show the disposition. It doesn't show how the case ended. So it looks like, oh, you, you have a, a theft charge, but it, they don't see that it was dismissed or sealed or expunged. So it's almost worse than not having it expunged at all, because then you can actually see the final result. Um, so this goes a little bit towards the question of defund the police. Where is it that we spend our tax dollars with the police? Now, Liz, and I told you guys, I'm a fan of the show. I listen to every episode. Uh, so, Liz, when you talk about you know your your prior life as a police officer and now your life as a social worker, how you respond to mental health um, emergency calls, and you know, I think you talked about how you always want to have a police officer with you for protection and safety. Is that so? No, not always. Uh, the only time that I will, and actually it happened this weekend, um, the only time that I will call police on scene if the report comes in from the caller that the individual is violent and aggressive. Um, regardless of that, so I will call PD when I'm like two minutes out because usually they get there before we do. Right. Um, but I'm in charge of the scene. And with that, you're the one that does most of the talking to people, paperwork, all that stuff. I'm the one who does it all. Right. So that, the, yeah, yeah. that frees up the police officer that once that scene's under control and once Liz no longer needs that officer, that officer's back on the beat ready to take the next call and not Correct. stuck processing an arrest, taking that person to central booking, contacting the DA's office to get the initial paperwork started, going to the courthouse to drop off the paperwork. That cop can now go back and start doing their job again. So and I've that, actually released cops, I'm sorry to interrupt you, on the scene. When, once the scene is secure and there's no violence because... We, right now, at least where I'm in, so I'm not in the city, um, we're not allowed necessarily to put our hands on anybody. So if the person starts swinging or becomes combative or whatever, then the police have to interject. But I'm there watching because there's a point where then you back off because you have to really match the behavior with the, what's happening mentally for the individual. And sometimes it may be release the restraint. And now let's, you know, let's back from this. So right. I have, there have been times where I've said, hey guys, um, we're good. You're clear. They can choose to stay. But I said, I don't really need this anymore. We're in a different place. But if I'm going to be issuing a commitment order, um, there's usually sometimes a struggle. And then that's a, a, a different conversation. But again, it's a mental health perspective. There are no legal charges, you know, being uh, brought forth or anything like that. So imagine a police force where they're not needed for every single call on a homeless person walking through a neighborhood. They're not needed on every single call of a teenager saying that they want to commit suicide. They're not needed on every single call of a drug overdose. They're not needed on every single call of a neighbor dispute. And now they're free to deal with much more serious crimes and investigations. And instead we take the resources that would have gone into the prisons, the jails, the arraignments and the judges and the clerks and just take some of that money and put them into social workers and psychological professionals and people that know how to de-escalate situations that don't necessarily have to use a gun right away but still have the police as a backup in case that happens. Correct. That is what a lot of people are referring to when they want to say something like defund the police but what the intent is is to try to figure out where the police are most needed, and then try to figure out where the police are not going to do as good of a job and get the people that can do a good right. job in there and the funding for those people to be able to do a good job. And I think it benefits everybody to have that sort of system set up. So the, the whole idea of can you get your record expunged? Well, they don't have the staff in the, in the 
the personnel to really go through and carefully get all the records out of the system. Why not? There's no funding for it. When they right. talk about things like uh, a call for mental health and psychological evaluation, well, you send a cop because you don't have someone else that can handle that situation in the moment. So how do we get those people without increasing the tax burden on, on everybody? Not defund the police, but figure out where the police are most needed, send them there, and then where they're not the most needed, get those resources to the people that can address those issues the best. It's super complicated, though. It's, it, it sounds easy to do in theory, but to get that done in practicality is a very complex issue. Not only that, the part of the process, and remind me if this happens in the city, I don't know if you'll be able to tell me, Mari, or, or, or you, Omar, uh, at least up here, if I'm on a scene where I have not, so we ask all the questions, right? Now we include the questions about COVID. Is there violence? What's going on? No, they're just, you know, a little bizarre. Okay, we show up. And we show up in teams of two. There's a tech that's a medical, uh, a medical professional, um, like an EMT, and then there's me, the clinician. And if I decide that the person needs to go to the hospital, I always try to get them to go voluntarily, right, through different ways. And if they don't, then I, I, I have the ability, the to issue a commitment order. I'm still not activating PD. I have no reason to. I call EMS because we don't transport. The minute I call EMS, PD is activated and they show on scene. And so now I have, even prior to all of this happening, now I have this person that I was able to stabilize, destabilize, because now they're seeing all these uniforms and I'm like, who call, what are you guys doing? Please step outside. Step, because I don't want it to get to that point where we have to put hands on anybody or whatever. I have you good right now. So step outside. And I've gotten into back and forth with some people because I'm like, so I don't want you here. Step outside. And then I have to explain this is going to des destabilize the scene and it's going to be something that it doesn't have to be. I have established a good rapport. I mean, we live in a pretty relatively small county. So people start to get to know you. So now when I go on a scene, they're like, oh, let's got it. Let, you know, let's back up. And they know that I don't cry wolf for nothing. But in a place like New York City, that's a lot more difficult to do. So remind me, I don't know, when you activate EMS, does PD still come? I think there has to be an additional step. It's not automatic. Uh, okay. I think there has to be some other indi additional indication that you know they need a cop there. So uh, I, I have one other uh, thing to talk about, about the criminal justice system. And this is very specific to New York City, some bullshit about facial identification that they're using right now. Um, oh. So, <laughs> yeah. Let's so, talk about profiling. This is uh, something that you know I learned firsthand very recently because it, it's a case I'm actually was working on, where uh, someone was accused of um, a very serious assault on somebody else. They were accused of using a sharp object and cutting the neck of another person. And these are two people that didn't know each other. There's no way to identify who's who. One person had a hoodie up. The other person also their face was was covered. And the police were able to use security footage of just a small clip of somebody's face to identify that person without a human being or another person saying, oh, yeah, I know, yo conozco ese fulano, ese vive ahí por, el, por la calle tal y tal y tal, right? It's just, oh, the facial identity, like they got a, a screenshot, they fed it through a computer system, and it came up with a name. That's the entire way that they identified this person. Wow. Wait, but aren't those systems flawed? because it can't identify different ethnicities? So uh, the question is, right, how accurate in general and whether it makes mistakes based on facial hair, based on makeup, based on the quality of the image, um, because, you know, n not all of them have the same resolution, um, based on the lightness or darkness of your skin or your skin tone, right? There's a lot of things that can go wrong. and. You know, we heard a lot about Apple with their face identification, the face uh, unlock, right? How for some people it works really well and for other people, not so well. Um, this is completely separate technology that New York City has been developing in partnership with who knows who. They don't really announce it, um, but it's called FIS, the Facial Identification Section. And I was amazed. Wait a second. Wait a second. Does that mean that they have our faces in their data bank? Like yeah. Omar already exists in their data bank, and so if, does if you if you walk by this, Times Square, they got you. Get the fuck out of here. Nope. You're kidding. Nope. But that's everywhere. I mean, right is now, that even no legal? 
Uh, so the collection of data that's out in public, you tell me. It's, you're walking around the streets in New York in, in yeah. public. It's, if someone happens to take a picture and you're in the background, are, are you entitled? They're, they're not selling it. They're not making. They're not commodifying or monetizing this. They're using this to identify people. But you know what? That's what they do in China. They literally have like a system where based on your social credit score, uh, and based on what you do, they, they keep track of you by face and by cameras. You're you, you're allowed to do some things, and you're allowed, in, and you're prevented from doing other things. It's like Black wow. Mirror. Wait a second. Wait a second. Yeah. Can you can you can you backtrack wow. a little bit? Can you explain a little bit about the social score? Because I read about it, and I think it's like so I've like Minority Report. Mm -hmm. Like have it's you guys so like have you guys seen Black Mirror? Oh yes. yeah. Yeah. I yes. haven't seen okay. Black Mirror. I have to see it. So, well, listen to this. Explain it, Omar, because I can't explain yeah, it. Yeah, I've but never it's heard of that. Freaking mind wow. Blowing. I mean, I know Big Brother's watching, but wow. So there have been a lot of reports coming out of China that they keep the government keeps a social score on you, and it's based on they have their criteria, right? They they list it out, and it's based on if you act, if you behave a certain way, if you do things in the interest of the country over your own personal interests, if you don't litter, if you, um, you know, uh, are always polite, uh, things like that. And your social score will go up or your, will, your social score will go down. And depending so on has your, a low score. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like depending a credit score, score. Like a it's, credit score. Yes, it's like a credit score. I would score. be so fucked. <laughs> Except for the littering part. You don't litter. <laughs> so if you have a low social score, and you'd want to travel outside of your province, you get denied. You can't board a train. If you want to go take out a loan and you have a low score, you get denied the loan. Your bank account might be even frozen. So it's like there are serious consequences if your score wow. goes too low. And then you can have to build it back test? up. Can we take that test? Can we, is there a I, test or, or, or something that we could do? We we all know you would fail in a second place. <laughs> well, I'm I'm still back on the prostitution thing. I'm trying to wheel my way out of that one, but that's a different conversation. Yeah. As a wait side wait note, a second. <laughs> Wait a second, but so does that force society to be on their best behavior at all times? And is that what what are the, the pros and the cons of this type of monitoring? But hold on, before you answer that, I don't think it's a it's, it's a deterrent because look at today we have laws and we have things that and people still commit crime or whatever. So I, no, but I, I mean, but I mean, like specifically, like in those countries that do that, like, is that why no. their crime rate is so low? Is that why there's such, no. you know, like disciplined people? And, and is that why they they um, obey, you know, like government rules and laws and things like that? Like, is yeah, that yeah. why societies are that way while we're like, you know, we have wild and crazy over here? <laughs> we have issues with wearing a mask. Oh, my God. Don't even get started. <laughs> No, Absolutely. Omar. I mean, I, I just, yeah, I just want to know, like, what, like, what? It, I don't know enough about it, but it's like, is that, you know, the result of something like that? So, yeah. I mean, you're talking about two extremely different cultures, Liz. You, you nailed it on the head. We live in a culture that emphasizes individual liberties, and that's more of what's considered Western culture, right? Emphasize an emphasis on individual freedoms, individual liberties, individual desires over uh, the aggregate, over your Come community, here. over you know, your city or town or whatever. To some degree, we um, appreciate uh, people that put family over individual, but beyond family, you know, it's each to their own. You, you protect your family at most and that's about it. But there really is a strong cultural preference towards individual freedoms. Mm -hmm. With the trade-off of that is the fact that you will have some more lawlessness, right? And that's a trade-off that for the most part, America is willing to accept in America embraces. There's a certain Wild West to America that you don't find in, uh, I guess, more traditional or Eastern civilizations. You even look at India, for example, where, um, and, and the joke is, if you if your last name is Patel and you live in New York, you already have extended family because there's so many uh, people of Indian descent who, with that last name. You, you don't care if they're from the same village or tribe or they're actually your cousin. Once you're here, they're your cousin, right? And you treat them like family. Uh, you see that sentiment a lot in Asian cultures where there's an emphasis on family and not just family, but community over individuals. Um, and China has really promoted that quite a bit with the Communist Party. They don't see it as a bad thing. They see it as, you know, their leader is a patriot, is, is like a fatherly figure. 
and he's there to lead you. He's a benevolent leader and you want a benevolent leader. And that's that is just a different mentality. I don't know if it's better. I don't know if it's worse. It's absolutely true that people probably have a safer existence, but it's also absolutely true that um, if you are a dissident, you disappear and you don't show up ever again. Uh, so it, it, it's a trade off. Uh, what, which one's the right one? I, I, I couldn't say. Uh, but America, we appreciate our individual freedoms. I'd like to see but, us go more to the middle a little bit, like a little half and half. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that, but but like with that facial recognition thing, it's just kind of like, is that like the direction that we're going in, but we're not aware of it? So. Oh, uh, going, we have been there for quite some time. So yeah. there's two elements to it. There's the private sector and then there's the public sector. The private sector has long been developing facial recognition software. I mean, again, your your iPhone will unlock based on your face, right? Um, your fingerprint also is another. So it's not just face, but any sort of biologic, biometric, biometric. data. Yeah. Right. Uh, we have watches that, you know, have your oxygen rate and take your pulse and track you while you sleep and all this stuff. A lot of this data that's being collected is not just sitting, uh, you know, innocently in some storage unit. It's being used. Um, the, the other thing with the facial recognition software, Amazon has been doing this for a long time. If you have the ring camera, the, the doorbell cam, they already made a partnership with local PD in a lot of places where mm -hmm. Amazon does not need to ask your permission or the police do not need to ask your permission to pull your video footage off of your ring camera to turn over to the government. It's already being done without ever telling you. So every time you walk in and out of your house and you are walking in and out at whatever time you want, your children, that's already being sent to the police automatically. And if the police want to track down, and some people say, this is a good thing. If the police want to track down a perpetrator or a suspect and they think they drove by your neighborhood or in front of your house, the police can pull that. They can see a license plate. They can verify that this is where the culprit has been. And some people say, you know what? I like that. That's protection for me too. Right. The police got my back. Other people right. say, I don't care if the police are good or bad or in the middle. I want them out of my house. My porch, my front yard is part of my castle, my kingdom. And I am protected from any government oversight, even if it's good oversight. Because then where do you draw the line between good and bad oversight? Exactly. So the private sector, Amazon, they even have uh, their workers, their delivery drivers, have front-facing cameras in the cars. If you're caught yawning, in your car, in your Amazon vehicle while you're making a delivery, you get penalized. If you are working in the warehouses and you have to have one of these steppers, right, it tracks your steps, and you're not walking enough steps in fast enough time to get your packages that are supposed to be prime delivery in two hours into a carton right. out the door, you get docked pay. So, like, these private companies are already watching us, and they are using contracts with the government to then give them the same technology that they develop. Um, Microsoft does it, Google does it, iPhone, Apple does it. So, so don't. Are we really free? Are we really? No. Here's the other thing about free to that. Do what now, we want. With all this work from home, companies are developing or have developed already software to be able to monitor uh, productivity. So they can monitor the keystrokes. Uh, how many keystrokes are you doing per day, depending on the job that you have? Uh, Damn and it. You should be, yeah, you should be doing a whole bunch of, you know, it's like that meme. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and you got to do the keystrokes. Otherwise, you're getting a call. Uh, so you only had a certain amount of keystrokes. What are you doing? Regardless if you have the productivity that you did the report or made the call, whatever. It's about the keystrokes. Omar, aside from the camera that they have that, has there been any new development regarding cell phones? Because I know that there was a lot of litigation regarding uh, Verizon or some of the big companies not wanting to give up the data and court. Uh, proceedings regarding that. I don't know what the update on that is. I don't know if you know. So the big case that everyone was aware about, it was, uh, I forget how many years ago now, there was a terrorist attack in San Bernardino. Uh, it was a husband and wife combo. Um, very tragic situation that happened. Yeah. And the, I think it was the wife's phone or the husband's phone were iPhones and they were confiscated and the government wanted to get into the phones. And this is something that's time sensitive because whatever contacts, if you believe that that person was connected to a bigger organization or a bigger network, you need to get those contacts off that phone now. You need those text messages, those iMessages, whatever WhatsApp encrypted messages, pictures, GPS coordinates now, right? So 
they went to Apple and they were like, hey, uh, can you unlock these phones for us? Because blah, blah, blah. And Apple was like, mm -mm, nope. We don't care what the purpose is, good or bad. We are not unlocking phones for any reason. They took a moral position. And a lot of people came down on Apple for taking that moral position because this is a terrorist attack. Why do you hate America, right? But then a lot of other people are like, no, America is about privacy and freedom. So I'm for it. You should be able to have your cell phone, and we don't care if you're a good actor or a bad actor. They eventually gave the phone to another third-party company. They unlocked the phone, so the whole thing got squashed. Um, where it is now is still to this day, your phone is an extension of your personal property. It's an extension of your privacy as per the courts in general. However, if you get a warrant to go into a phone, then you're allowed to. The government is allowed to get into your phone. A warrant could be an eavesdropping warrant. So you're not arrested yet. You're not charged with anything yet, but they suspect that you're on the phone with bad people so they can wiretap your phone. And with wiretaps also comes text messages. With wiretaps also comes the ability to uh, do what's called a ping on your phone. So whatever yes. tower or Wi-Fi you're connected to, they can verify its location. And this is the great part. This comes up a lot with my, um, I do a lot of work where people are accused of being in a gang. The big one in Long Island right now that everyone's talking about is MS-13. Mm -hmm. If you have five or six people in a clique from MS-13 and you want to prove that they're actually having meetings and talking about gang stuff to do gang things, what do you do? You get all of their cell phones and you ping them regularly throughout the day. And at some point you, f you get five or six cell phones in the same house in the same room and you know, oh, okay, these five or six people, they're having a gang meeting because we suspect all of them of being part of La Mara and they're all together for two hours and then they all disperse and leave. And if you can show enough of those cell phones coming together and then leaving, you have repeated meetings and that's a conspiracy and you can charge all of them with felonies even if no one did anything other than meet so the the laws around cell phones they're still considered private but you can get a warrant super easy i've never had a judge throw out a search warrant or an eavesdropping warrant on a phone ever not once um, hmm. well we don't have much time but i do want to find out if you can tell us what happened to your client that was uh facially recognized uh, the law does not permit me to go into the details of what's going <laughs> <Damn> on. <it. laughs> I, I was just using this general, you know, to, to speak more generally about the fact that New York City is really, and they've ramped it up, you know, in the last couple of years, this FIS or facial identification section of the NYPD, and they're using it to positively ID people without any human interaction or anyone saying, yes, that's the defendant. That's the person that hurt me. So it's, it's to me as a... Um, not just as a criminal defense lawyer, but as a lawyer that, you know, I, I study constitutional law in law school, that sounds like a serious violation of what's called the confrontation clause, where you are allowed to confront your accuser. You are allowed to cross-examine your accuser, because that's really where you f can flesh out in a court of law who is lying and who's telling the truth and what the truth is. So you're, you're not allowed to do, how do you question an AI software program? How do you question an algorithm? You can't. And that's what we're relying on now in New York City to make arrests on people for serious violent charges. So it's problematic for me. I, and I can't talk about too much more than that other than that's the only proof that they have that this is who it is, was can one hit. Can I ask hit. another question? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, Mari, can I ask another question? Oh, yeah, but just, you know, we have Quickly. like a, so, a few minutes. So <laughs> on that, though, how do you feel about the, um, the, the, the reform now where you your accuser has to come forth and there there were a couple of cases in long island where people did come forth and they, they were killed um i forget i am probably not using the right terminology the law that i'm talking about that they reformed or they made changes to that if anybody accuses you you don't you're not a secret you anymore. have the you have the right to face your accuser or something like that i remember right yeah. but it's specific right uh, so the the law hasn't really changed the that the defendant's right to face their accuser. What the law has changed is the time frame in which that's supposed to happen and the time frame in which the accuser's information gets provided to bail, the defense. Bail reform, I'm sorry, bail reform law. Oh, okay, so bail reform, different thing. Bail reform is when you first get arrested, do you have to sit in jail waiting for your trial or does the judge have to let you go free with some conditions, right, and you get to go home? 
So the question is, well, if cops are making arrests on people, people that are accused of doing violent stuff, and judges are just saying, okay, you can go home now, they're not dismissing the charges. They're just saying, while the investigation and the litigation is pending, you can go home instead of sitting in Rikers. That's it. That's the only change. Okay. But wasn't and, part of that, I'm sorry to interrupt you, wasn't part of that that your, you, your accuser had to come forth? Because there was a particular case, I remember in Long Island, as I'm misconstruing it, where the person had to testify, they had the right to have the person come, and then that person got killed. It was a gang uh, case or whatever. Right. I think it happened last year. So what, what that's kind of translated into is now the timeline is so much shorter. The prosecutor has to provide, and this came together with the bail reform, has to provide information on any and all witnesses right. within 45 days. So when you have some bad actors, okay, and you have some real legit criminals out there, real gangbangers and real drug dealers that are violent, and now they know, oh, Johnny is going to, Johnny snitched on me, and Johnny's going to testify against me. What do you think happens to Johnny? And they find out within the first month and a half. So that's been the change. It used to be that they didn't have to divulge a witness list until the eve of trial. So you have two years of litigation on a case, and then the, jury select, the jury's been selected, they're about to get sworn in, you're about to do your opening statements, and that's when the prosecutor says, here you go, Mr. Defense Attorney, here's all the witnesses I plan on calling at trial, and now you know it's Johnny, but Johnny's already in the back room about to testify that same day. So you can't threaten Johnny. How do you right? feel about that? Um, so in general, the new laws, I think they went too far in making the jobs impractical for police, judges, and prosecutors. But the reason why they went too far, and this is crucial, this is important, was because for way too long, way too long, a system that's supposed to protect a defendant's rights steamrolled defendants. A system where a defendant has the right to a speedy trial turned into you have to have your trial today or you go to jail right. or you have to plead guilty today or you go to jail so all these protections and levers and mechanisms to give a layer of safety to a defendant for a fair trial turned into ways of negotiating against heavy heavy leverage against a defendant to take an unfair plea so that's why the law changed it went too far but it went too far because it had to in my opinion, and again, former prosecutor here, I should never have been able to withhold grand jury minutes until five seconds before the trial starts. That's the whole point of preparing a defense. How do you, pre how do you prepare something if it's a trial by surprise? Right. So there are changes that need to be made still. They made some adjustments already, but really it's, it's because the system was so unfair for so long. So I'm, I'm kind of for but it. But the, uh, the, the result of all this is now that people won't come forward for fear, especially in big cases like this. I, nobody can protect me and I'm, everybody's going to know who I am. I'm testifying against somebody. Um, and so I'm just not going to say anything because I, I have to have my life. Right. And so so to the, me, the trade off is if the government wants the power that they, that they are wielding, then they should be able to offer protection to their witnesses. Yeah. Yeah. They should be able to protect their case. So increase the laws where the, the judges can issue protective orders. Right, sealing some information, but not a blanket, not a blanket redaction of all information. Give the DA's offices and the police the ability to actually sequester witnesses, protect them, give them details, so that they don't feel like they're in danger. But you can't have it both ways. You can't have all that power and leverage without the responsibility. You can't have it both. Wow. Okay. Well, we went over our time, but I, it's well worth Shocker. it because every, every single time, like I walk away having so much more knowledge and also feeling like better informed, but with a bunch of questions also. So like we always say, we need to have you back again. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I, I didn't get enough. I didn't, I didn't... We, we need to have you back again. I can't like, todo. I todo. Coño, cada gotica. <laughs> since, we're not, since we're not being billed hourly. Um, anyways, um, Omar, can you share how our listeners can find you? Absolutely. So uh, my website, almanzarlaw.com is just my last name. And then you can find me on Instagram, it's A-P-L -L, uh, underscore L-L-C. Uh, so at A-P-L underscore L-L-C. A-P-L stands for Almanzar Paramio Law. L-L-C is my limited liability corporation. And you cover cases in all of New York only, or do you do other states or? 
all for, for my criminal cases, because you have to physically be there from Westchester all the way out to Riverhead, so downstate New York, for any sort of car accidents, personal injury cases, that's all in New York State. So us in Jersey are fucked. Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's for nice other reasons, too, but yeah. <laughs> Hey, hey, hey. Anyways, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for um, sharing your time and educating our audiences along with us. Guys, thank you for listening. And y'all know how to support, you know, our OnlyFans and our Patreon <laughs> and our merch and stuff. So, Can I get Zuli's um, feet? No, seriously. Zuli. Oh. <laughs> seriously. I want to see them Anyways. toes. Yeah, right out. <laughs> see right them out. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, guys, till next time. Bye. Bye. Ladies of El Salon, the Chronicles. Oh, yeah, Ladies of El Salon, the Chronicles. Escucha.